children about the importance of resilience and to do it in a way that you can relate to. The illustrator is Piper Colston, and she's a middle school student from Rivera, which is just down the road. So we're really excited about her as well being here. And boys and girls, um, we know our uh, author as Coach Brew. So boys and girls, Bruce County, let's go ahead and do a round of welcome to our author and illustrator. Good morning. If you can hear me, clap your hands once, twice, three times. Give yourself a round of applause for being here. Can I grab the handheld mic from you? Yeah, just so you know, I have a headset. I'm built like Garth Brooks, but I feel like Brittany wearing it. I won't dance, I promise. So this is Piper, she's my illustrator. She uh, is gonna be really the star of the show because you guys will be able to relate to her on a level that you won't be able to relate to me. Um, sort of what we've done is we created this children's book and I realize none of you are children. How old are you? Yeah, and you're what grades? So you got it all figured out. You don't need me to read you a children's book, right? Now, how many of you actually like want, like, we could have snacks delivered because we're in the cafeteria, you could have snacks, milk, cookies, and you could take a nap while I read a children's book to you? Or would you rather do something more age appropriate for your grown up selves? Uh, this is the definition of mixed emotions, right? Like, I'd love a nap and a snack, but I don't want to be treated like a little kid, right? So, what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of take you through how we brought this project to life. I have some questions that Piper will answer for you, and uh, then we're going to do uh, some activities. It's going to be pretty engaging, and have you getting up, moving around, doing some things um, that relate the story that is a children's book to adults your age who have the world all figured out already. But you, you, you got it all figured out, right? Show of hands if you got it all figured out. Really? Okay, there's one. Awesome. So uh, before we do that, you know, I want to thank our friends at Thomas J. Henry for making all of this possible for us. Thanks to their support, uh, you know, we're able to travel around South Texas, surrounding districts. And, and kind of share the message of the book and share the book with everyone. So thanks to them and uh, thank you to the administration here and everyone who's worked so uh, tirelessly behind the scenes to kind of pull it all together. And Piper, uh, are, are you missing school today for this? Kind of. Would you say you're actually missing school or you're just out of school? You're not missing, right? Okay, that's good. If you're actually missing school. So, um, and uh, you guys remember, I know it was a long time ago. Remember the, the thing that was like a pandemic? It was like a pan, like the pandy. You remember the pandy? Yeah, this is the depressing part of the last couple of years for someone like me who makes his living writing books and speaking about his books is during the pandemic, Six of the top 20 best-selling books in America were adult coloring books. That's kind of depressing, right? Or do you like adult coloring books? Yeah, me neither. So uh, I thought we'd just kick this off with, uh, I don't know, we'll do some adult coloring, okay? You guys want to color? Okay. So, um, Every project that you do starts out with what? It's like a blank slate, right? There's nothing to it. Before you start writing a paper, you've got blank pages, right? And then you have to fill it in, right? See, this is the interactive portion of the presentation today. So when I ask a question, you can go like that or like that. Right? And then we have to kind of fill things in, right? Yeah. 
And then after you do kind of let's say an outline and fill it in black and white, what happens? Hmm? <laughs> what? Did you say I'm colorblind? Oh, okay. So you just fill it in and then boom. Yeah. It turns into colors. So what Piper did an amazing job with was taking a blank sheet of paper with my words on it, doing an outline, a rough draft, and then bringing it to life full time in full living color as a finished project. So what we want to do is uh, just kind of want to show you a little bit of how that came to life. And we're going to show you the book, but uh, it's not going to be story time where like I read you the book because, well, um, you're mature adults, right? Huh? Okay. So uh, before we do this, we want to play a little game of uh, quarters. No, just kidding. We're going to play uh, a little game called Heads or Tails. This will be the interactive portion where I'm actually asking you to, to get up. And before you get up, you're not going to shout out whether you think it's heads or tails. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to put your hand on your head if you think it's going to be heads. And you're going to put your hands on your tails if you think it's going to be tails. Okay? So if you, and this is like honor system. Honor system. Because I can't keep track of all of you. If you're wrong, you need to sit down, okay? And we're gonna have your teachers play as well. All right, we'll maximum participation here. You ready? Ready, Piper? You wanna call it out? I'll flip it, you'll call it out, ready? All right, so you're gonna stand up, you're gonna choose heads or tails, let's go. All right, make your choice quickly, you ready? And it is? It's tails. Yeah. All right, so you still got a tail seat. Round two. You ready? For those left standing, heads or tails, make your call. Ready? Make your call. It's heads. All right, round three. You ready? Make your call. Tails. Right, how many do we have left? Do we have any teachers left? All right, we're grading on a curve. There we go. Make your call. You ready? It's heads. All right, we got what? Five people left. Let's go again. It's heads again. Who's left? What's your name? Yeah. And what's your name? All right, so this is it. You ready? Final round. Okay? Make your guess. Uh, yeah, you got to guess different things. It's heads. All right, give them a round of applause. Thank you guys for playing along. Thank you for playing along. So this is my family. Uh, That's my kids when they were in middle school. Uh, my wife's way better looking than me, I know. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, I pulled into town today. I was just telling some of your teachers, like I pulled into town today. It reminds me of the town I grew up in. I grew up in a little town in central Pennsylvania. You know where the Gettysburg Battlefield is? Raise your hand if you've heard of the Gettysburg Battlefield. My heart is weeping right now that only three hands went up. The Battle of Gettysburg. Raise your hand if you ever heard of the Civil War. Okay, there was this battle during the Civil War called the Battle of Gettysburg. I grew up in the next town over. There we go. But it reminds me an awful lot of your town. So I came in the building and thinking about it. It just reminds me when I was your age and how much fun that wasn't. Because I wasn't a great student. I kind of went through this awkward phase for a long time, and um, I didn't hit my stride until later. And you know, part of the motivation with writing this book is to help you know kids hit their stride, uh, because 
I'm sort of an example of not doing that. But this was the first book I wrote when I was in second grade. And uh, it's a very serious book as judged by the uh, uh, wood paneling wallpaper I chose to use for a cover. Uh, and it was probably the worst thing in my entire class. Everyone had really nice, colorful, you know, well-illustrated covers, like something very artistic, like what Piper would create, and then this was me. Uh, I had no idea I wanted to be an author when I was in second grade. We just had an assignment to write a book. And so that's what I did. It was called John of the Jungle, where I thought I was Tarzan, and I was fighting lions and tigers and bears. Backstory behind this, I apologize in advance for the visual. I really legitimately used to think when I was in second grade that I was Tarzan. I'd run around the neighbor neighborhood, like in a leopard print speedo, climbing trees and like chasing animals and things. Horrible visual, I know, but like, we're being honest here. That was kind of my backstory, and uh, I never thought in a million years I'd become an author. This is my first actual grown-up book that I wrote after a 12-year career as a teacher and a coach. So what I'm doing now is kind of a second career for me, speaking and writing. And uh, the work has evolved a little bit from the first one, right? And it's a big part of this message today for everybody is like, your first draft is supposed to suck. You're not supposed to be happy with it, and then it's supposed to get better. But you can't just say, I'm not happy with it, and throw it in the garbage and give up. You have to persevere, right? So, ended up writing a few more books. Uh, interesting story that I'll share with you is um, when I was in 10th grade, you know, you, you have some good teachers, and then you have some teachers that you don't necessarily hit it off with, right? Has everyone had that experience? So in 10th grade, I had a teacher I didn't exactly hit it off with. Have you ever had a teacher you didn't click with once or twice? Oh, you love everybody, everybody loves you. Okay. So I had this teacher, we'll call him Bob, because that's his actual name. Full disclosure, his name's Bob Rankin. And he was my ancient civilization teacher, really exciting class. And I did a horrible job in ancient civilization. And he let me know. And he would tell me, like, John, you're just a bad student. You're a terrible writer. You're a horrible presenter. You're going to fail this class. You probably ought to be held back in 10th grade because you're not ready for 11th grade. 11th grade is US history. And you're not going to be able to do the research project or give the presentation. And it's a huge project for your final grade. So I was like, thanks. I think. So anyway, I ended up somehow by the grace of God passing that class, going into 11th grade. I did a wonderful job on that project. But more importantly, you know, I didn't hold that against him. I used that as fuel for the fire. Like people are going to tell you no, and you need to do things in spite of them. Right? And sometimes you might actually have an unsupportive teacher. Just maybe once. So um, because I'm forgiving and I don't hold a grudge, I've always been generous and kind enough to send him a signed copy of one of my new books whenever it comes out, just to remind him. But um, that was really the only bad experience I had, but I used that to, to make myself better. So that's the kind of the whole takeaway for you. You can get bitter, you can get better with these things, right? So uh, how do I end up from Portland, Maine, down here in South Texas? How did I connect with Piper Colst and her family, the Rivera School District, and end up here in your community as well? Well, there's one person that um, really kind of inspired me to take a look at doing this project. You saw all the, uh, the business books that I've written. I never thought in a million years I'd write a children's book. And I never thought I'd have uh, a student who's right around your age be an illustrator for a children's book that I wrote. But um, Miss Rhonda Auckland's a teacher at Rivera, High School, at Rivera School District and uh, become friends with her family. We're talking during uh, kind of the tail end of the pandemic when you know, I can't really travel to speak about my other books and um, you know, nobody buys books anymore, right? Everything's like dirt cheap and free on the internet. So she's like, why don't you write a children's book? Something about resilience, something about positivity and positive attitude and mindset. I'm like, I'm not a children's author. I'm not a children's author. 
And she said, writing's writing. And if you take that perspective, like that writing's writing, you know, drawing's drawing, you know, like painting's painting, like you're just taking what that fundamental skill is and you're moving into a different context. And she was like, what do you have to lose? You, you have the benefit of free time. I said, well, okay, if I do try this, if, who's going to illustrate it? And she said, I know exactly who would do that for us. So she kind of had the whole thing planned out, had a vision for it that I didn't uh, anticipate. And that's how I was fortunate enough to get connected with Piper. My point with all this is if you look at two different plots on the map, your world is a lot smaller than my world when I was your age. I'm pre-internet. I couldn't connect online at the speed of light with someone halfway across the country or halfway across the world for that matter. You have the benefit of being able to do that. You're going to have so many more opportunities academically, athletically, with your hobbies and interests, school, you know, anything, making friends. That's the advantage you have today. Take advantage of that. So this whole project was done basically via what mode of communication, Piper? Email. Email and what? Text. Text message. It was unheard of for probably you know, myself, your parents, and uh, a lot of your teachers to be able to complete something like this of this magnitude, you know, using your thumbs, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about, and there's Piper illustrating Piper. We're going to talk a little bit about how we brought this project to life and how some of the lessons in the book do relate to you, okay? Um, so the first thing I want to ask, though, is that I want to ask Piper to give you a little background about her and you know, how she got started because here's the interesting thing. You know, I remember I was told I was a terrible writer, right? I was told I was a terrible writer. Well, I'm a self-trained writer. I never, like, I didn't major in like, rhetoric and fiction or English or anything like that in college. I was a psychology major, which qualifies me as an adult in the workforce to do nothing. If that's for me, I'm not here. So I was self-trained, and that's one of the fascinating things is, like, weren't you a self-trained artist? Yes. So at what age did you kind of get started and decide, like, this is something I really want to do? Um, I don't know how old I was, but I just know that pretty young, I guess. I... It's like five, six, maybe, around there? Probably. Um, I ate the crayons at that age, did you? <laughs> okay. So <laughs> like, how did things start and how did they evolve with your art? Did it start out with, like, like most kids, like a coloring book and drawing, or even into other things. Um, I just kind of, I, I drew, I just drew pictures, and then I was like, I kind of like this, so then I uh, did more of it, and then uh, I improved. Or, I guess. But it wasn't pretty at first. No. Is that what you're politely trying to say? I guess. I guess. Okay. Yeah. And is it supposed to be? No, right? Whatever you're doing, it's not supposed to look good at first, right? You guys ever heard of the 10,000 hour rule? Oh, I'm sure your teachers have. Anyone heard of the 10 year or 10,000 hour rule? No. This young lady, are you 7th, 8th eighth, eighth grade? I'm going into 8th. Eighth. 8th, eighth, going into 8th. So what's the 10,000 hour rule? It takes 10,000 hours to master something. 10 years or 10,000 hours to be an expert. Two claps. What's, what's your name? Michelle, two claps for Michelle. 10 years, 10,000 hours. So how many years have you been, like, what's your favorite thing that you like to do and how many years you've been doing that? Probably not 10 years, probably not anywhere near 10,000 hours, right? So like this accomplishment of illustrating this book and the other art projects that you've done so well, like are you even closing in on 10,000 hours? I have no idea. 10 years? You're starting to get close to that 10-year window, right? I guess. Okay. So, think about that for a minute. Like, what do you like to do that's, you're not quite where you want to be, or you don't think you're good at something, but you kind of enjoy it, and I want you to add three 
one word, three letters to that sentence you kind of tell yourself. Like for me, it's like I like to try and play the guitar. I'm terrible. I don't have a musical bit of DNA in my body. I'm taking lessons and I'm not good at it yet. So those are the three letters for you yet. Y E T. So as opposed to saying I'm not good at basketball yet, uh, it's, I'm not good at basketball yet. Um, not good at art. I'm not good at art yet. I'm not good at English, according to Mr. Rankin, but I'm not good at it yet. So if you can think about that, that'll be very helpful for you, okay? Because you're not supposed to, I know I told you before, you guys probably have it all figured out in the beginning, right? But you're not supposed to have it all figured out, right? You're not supposed to know what you want to do. You're supposed to explore your interests. So your interests, were they uh, now painting, sculpture, illustration? What, what, what's your preference? You know, I look at, I look at you kind of like, I know this is a question you weren't anticipating, but I, I look at you as kind of like a multi-sport athlete. So like, do you like football, basketball, or baseball, kind of? Like, these are your different seasons. Like, what are your different sort of uh, artistic genres, if you will, or, or means that you prefer to express yourself? Honestly, I think as, as long as I'm able to create something, to be able to conceptualize, then it, I'm happy. And here's kind of the message for you with what she just said is like you just described a generalist, right? You can sculpt, you can paint, you can illustrate a book. Like I think the generalists are starting to run the world because there's so much information available online to help accelerate the learning curve for you with expertise, right? So be a generalist, explore different interests, figure out what you like. So we're going to bring the book to life. Uh, Piper, let's talk a little bit about the cover design process and how you sort of put me in my place, right? You want to talk about how you put me in my place? Sure. Okay, so when Miss Yachlin introduced me to Piper, uh, I had an idea of what I thought the cover of the book ought to look like and the description of like what you know, illustrations ought to match the words on the page. And I said, could you create this cover concept based on my description? And Piper said, yes, I'd be happy to. Plot twist. You want to describe for everyone what really happened and why it turned out so much better? Uh, well, it was a the, the, the cover of the book was originally going to be a scene from the book where it was um, kind of a race scene. It's between two characters. Um, racing obviously um, but uh, as I as I finished it and I read the manuscript of the book I realized that the the cover of it wasn't necessary it wasn't relevant to the theme that it was portraying portraying I don't know if that's a word um, that's a great word okay yeah. that's great um, but um, so I reached out to him and I was saying like I don't think it, it doesn't convey the theme well enough for someone to see it and go, okay, this is a racing book. Maybe maybe I want a racing book for my kid. Um, and so I gave John this other concept, and he liked it a little bit more, so I decided to keep it. You're being too polite. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'll, I'll give you like the raw, unfiltered version of how this conversation went. It was one of the first times we talked. So we get on the phone, and she says to me, I said, I really love like the cover design you did and the illustration of the first page. Like I'd like to hire you to illustrate the whole book. And she's like, that'd be great, but I'm like, uh oh. And she said, um, if I might interject something, like like this professional, she said, I would like to propose an alternate concept to be rendered for the design. And I'm like, wow, okay. Um, and like here I'm thinking, this is sort of like, so our presentation is sort of like a Pixar movie. There's gonna be some content for you guys and some content for the adults in the room and the teachers. So this is sort of a teaching point for the grown-ups in the room and the parents. Is like, I'm 52, I've published how many books? And here's this eighth grader telling me, yeah, you know, I'd like to propose an alternate cover design. I'm like, really? 
And she said, uh, I don't believe that the idea that you described gives the story, does the story justice. I think three words. It doesn't really do it justice, you know, the lessons in the story. So I thought about that, and I saw I had seen some samples of your art, and I said, you know what? I should listen to her. And I'm so glad I did. And I think a lot of times as educators or adults or as parents, we think we have all the answers because we have all this life experience and we're, quote, educated. Uh, but we've kind of been seeing the world through our own vantage point a certain way with a certain fixed mindset that we've had for so many years that what we actually need to do is see it through another vantage point and in this case, a younger lens. And so my message to the parents and the teachers is don't immediately discount ideas you get from other younger sources and be willing to listen. And the message I have for all the students here with regard to that is think about for a minute like how much she pushed back on my what I thought was my brilliant idea and how much courage it took to have a difficult conversation with an adult that she doesn't know that lives halfway across the country. To pick up the phone, yeah, I know none of you use your phone to make phone calls. Trust me, I know that. I have a 16 and 18 year old daughter, and the only way to hear from them or communicate with them is with a text, right? But she picked up the phone, and we had a conversation, which I know is like unheard of for most of you, right? So to be able to step outside your comfort zone, if there's something you believe that strongly in, that you believe could be a better idea. And if someone's brave enough and strong enough to do that, we have an obligation as adults to listen and to take that to heart, right? And on a side note, like this is the first time I've ever had this kind of experience. And like, I wanna give you all the credit in the world for it, but I have also not lost sight of the fact that the state that that took place in. Like, I love Texas, I identify as Texan. Like, I'm from Pennsylvania, I live in Maine, but I love your state. And I love this part of the state, and here's why. You don't think you're better than everybody else, you really actually are better than everybody else, and you guys have this swagger. So as I was listening to her, I'm like, I can't ignore the swagger and confidence. And sure enough, this is the finished product that she created that was way better than the idea I had. So like, I'd love to see you guys kind of channel some of that into your swagger and your confidence. There's a difference between that and cockiness and arrogance, right? What's the difference? Confidence is cockiness on a leash, right? You can control it, you can direct it. Okay, you wanna repeat that after me? Confidence is? All right, let's try again. This is the interactive portion of everything. Confidence is? Confidence. Cockiness on a leash. No? So have some of that, right? you Texans, for God's sakes. So she created this sort of designed to bridge the gap between the action scenes within the book. And I'll let you read it as we go. We just kind of talk about the project. You're not little kids, I'm not gonna read your story, right? Out of respect for you. But the important thing we want you to see is like there are rough drafts that take place and the first kind of raw, unfiltered version of what you do is not supposed to be perfect, right? It's all about progress, not perfection. Look at the difference in the images here. Piper, can you just speak a little bit on just how you polish this diamond in the rough here? I guess I just had a black and white. I, obviously, I sketched it first, that's what you kind of have to do, um, but I I sketched the whatever, I don't know, um, and then I, col I colored it. So like, look at the space, and she kind of lets the uh, animals breathe a little bit, they're not crammed into a room. Like this 
doesn't look as much like a classroom as that, right? One of the things I love and I respect and admire about Piper so much is she's a perfectionist. And good enough isn't. So there are a lot of these images that we've seen that were good enough for me. You know, I'm an untrained eye when it comes to art, but it wasn't good enough for her. And you can kind of see some different vantage points. Certain things are crystal clear, other things are blurred out, right? What does that do? Does that adjust your focus? Does that change where your eye goes? Right? And that's by design, right? Take a look at what I want you to take a look at are like some of the facial expressions you see. And here's a little learning takeaway for you. Let's have a moment here, okay? Let's have a moment, right? If you're watching Rudy the Kangaroo in his eyes, and you're not reading the text, but you're looking at his eyes, you don't need to know what the words are on the page because it says it all. What's that old saying the picture's worth? Can I phone a friend and, and, and get a teacher? A picture's worth a thousand words, right? Tough crowd today. So you get to see some of the scenery here. You get to see the body language. And as I look around the room, I see different body language. Some of you are completely bored and disinterested. Others of you, you know, aren't. You're leaning forward, you're engaged, you're making eye contact. You're not sitting back. Your eyes are open. You're paying attention to the screen. You're listening. We can see you. Like, there's what you say and then there's your actions. And people are going to follow your actions way more than what you say. So I'd like to do a little activity with you real quick and then we'll jump back into talking about the book. Do you believe me that your body language screams even when your voice just speaks? How many people believe that? Okay, we got some skeptics. Here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like everybody to stand up. Stand up. Okay. I'd like you to raise your arm. I'd like you to raise your arm. Okay, I don't know why so many of you are waving. Okay. Now here's what I want you to do. I'd like you to take your thumb and your index finger, and I'd like you to put them together and make a circle. Okay? All eyes on me. Okay? You make a circle. Right? And here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that circle and I want you to put it right here on your chin and freeze. Now turn and look at the person next to you. Say, that's not my chin. Half of you, at least half of you put it right here. What'd you do? All right, have a seat. Let's break that down real quick. What'd you do? What'd you do? You did what you saw me do. You followed my body language, not my words, right? All right, Jedi mind trick number one, right? So look at the body language you're conveying when you're talking to people. Look at the body language on this kangaroo. It tells you everything you need to know. The words are just an accessory. And it's often the case. People can read you and your intentions you know, before you fully walked in the room. So we're going to breeze through a couple of these. What do you notice in this picture? How can you tell he's flying? Okay, so what do you notice about the cheetah? How can you tell he's gone? He's faded, right? He's, his name's Streaky, and he's like kind of, she's very, very strategically blurred him out to reveal what? 
Speed, right? I asked her about this yesterday, and she's like, yeah, that came to me immediately. Like, that wasn't like something she had to think about or, you know, go back and change. It was just, I don't know, I was blown away by that Piper. So Rudy's experiencing some adversity. He does not do well on the test. Has anyone ever not done well on a test? Okay, thank you for your honesty. Thank you. Uh, he thought he was going to finish first in a race and a high jump, and he certainly did not. Has anyone ever thought that? Like, oh, I'm going to do well, and then someone beat you to it? Okay. So what's the mistake you made with that? You were kind of like beating yourself up about it. Someone did better than you at something, sports, you know, after school activity, class. What's the mistake you made? You bring yourself down how? By what? Huh? You're comparing yourself to somebody else, right? You guys do that all the time on social media, don't you? You're looking at what everybody else puts on Instagram and how perfect they make their world look. And you're comparing your blooper reel to their highlight reel. Is that fair to you? No. Thank you. It's not fair to you. And I want to encourage you to, to just stop. Okay? And this is one of the lessons Rudy learns in the book. Is like you got to compare. You're looking at the wrong competition. The competition is not your classmates. The competition is you today versus you yesterday. And that's the lesson he learns. And if you forget everything else today, I want you to learn that. And I want you to realize that, like, Winners help other people win, and that's one of the things that Rudy really learns in the book through some adversity. He goes from competing against his classmates to trying to help them. And his parents help him through that. We're going to flip through this real quick, okay? Because I have a point I want to make with this. Now, Piper, this is... Uh, this is, I believe, the, uh, a frustration point for you with the illustrations that we're approaching here. Yeah. Where you spend a few days kind of grinding out how you're going to change the rough draft to the finished product. Can you want to walk us through that and just how long it took you? Well, with some of the pages, it was just, I mean, it was just um, getting the colors or like lighting right layout just being able to help it pair well with the text and still seem like it was you know. you're sort of beating your head against the wall over that for how long um some pages took close to three or four days when usually they take only about a day i guess one page three or four days right what's the lesson there stuff takes time yeah and sometimes you just, as opposed to trying to polish something that you're not happy with, maybe you need to just see it from a different perspective. Like, I love the way she changes the angles, you know, that she approaches the illustrations with. And adds way more body language. So your version of that could be, you, know, you have something in your mind that you want to do and you keep kind of butting up against these roadblocks and speed bumps with the project you're working on. What if you just put that down for a little while and try and look at it from a different point of view? Is that possible? It's easier said than done, right? So what was the most uh, rewarding part of this whole experience as we're sort of uh, closing out the book here? stuff that doesn't even it doesn't it shouldn't even relate to illustrating a book but like you know boundaries knowing your limits um, stuff like that but oh, 
So here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you thought this whole event, this whole talk was about illustrating a book, and you're thinking, what's this have to do with me? This is like illustrating a book has nothing to do with me. What we're talking to you, why we're talking to you separate from you know, your other, the other students in your school district, is this has everything to do with you because what was the most frustrating part of the project? It was taking so long and it was very difficult to, like, it was just, yeah, I just said it, it was difficult trying to make sure everything was perfect. And I had a lot of imposter syndrome because I feel like I didn't deserve to be illustrating a book for a professional. I just felt like everyone was going to, I was like, oh, it's so obvious that a, that a kid drew this. I mean, you can tell. Look at everything that's wrong with it. Um, so here's the, here's the funny thing. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I think it's an important point for you guys. First of all, now that she knows me, am I really all that professional? No. No. So there's that. But seriously, like... You guys all know what imposter syndrome is? Do you know what it is? It's like feeling you're not worthy to be doing something that you're doing when in fact you really are worthy and qualified. Okay? I think you all have your own version of that, whether you realize it or not. For her, it was illustrating this book. Here's an experienced, self taught expert artist who didn't feel like this was something she was worthy of or qualified to be doing. Now the funny part of that is there's like how you feel in your own head and then there's this other reality that exists. And this is where you're all in this story. It's not about illustrating a freaking book, okay? It's about what you think versus reality. That voice inside your head that tells you you're not worthy, you have imposter syndrome, you're not qualified when in fact you are. Because I shared these illustrations with her before I even got the, I got a final draft, but before I got the very final draft, that's another whole learning point for you. I shared those illustrations with my peers who are experienced professional authors, several of whom have written you know, very successful children's books, uh, professional illustrators. Um, my father-in-law's wife is a, um, a very successful artist. I shared them with these, quote, well, qualified professionals. And they thought these illustrations came from a professional illustrator with decades of experience from like one of the New York, big New York City publishing houses. I said, it's an eighth grader in Rivera, Texas, and they're blown away. So like her reality of like, I don't feel like I'm worthy of this, or I'm not sure this is good enough, doesn't match public perception. And I'm telling you, your reality is talking you out of things that you should and could be doing. And to get out of your own head and start filling your mind with positive thoughts. Like the mantra behind this book is what, Piper? What's Rudy's famous phrase? Chin up, chest down, and move forward. Yeah, so like your body language doesn't speak, it screams. Get your chin up, your chest out. Your body language changes how you feel. It changes your emotions. The emotion changes emotion. And just to move forward, because you can't move backwards, right? You got to get that voice outside of your head. Because the voice inside of your head will talk you into things it shouldn't. So let's do another activity really quick to kind of prove to you that you have this voice inside your head that's a little counterproductive for you might be a little counterproductive. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like everyone to stand up. Like you raise your right, let's quiet down, right? These are important instructions. Raise your right arm as high as you can. Okay? Next. I want you to raise it a little higher. Take a look around, Foul. We got a little problem here. Have a seat. Let's break that down. Keep the score at home. That's Jedi mind trick number two. What was my first set of instructions? Word for word, what was my first set of instructions? Raise your hand what? 
And what was my second set of instructions? Okay, so what did you do the first time? The first time. You're like, oh, okay. And then what was my second instruction? A little higher. So you pulled your shoulder out of the socket a little bit. You got up on your tippy toes, right? Your brain and how you're talking to yourself told you, oh, yeah, this, uh, this is what I can do. This is what I'm capable of. But then I asked you for a little more. What'd you do? You gave me a little more, right? Nobody stood on the table. That's good. That'd probably be like a liability issue. Thank you. Your principal thanks you. But here's my point. It's kind of that internal dialogue you have, just like with imposter syndrome. You're telling yourself something that's putting an artificial ceiling on what you're capable of, right? I am so glad. I am like, you have no idea how grateful I am that you, yes, you, didn't let that internal dialogue, that imposter syndrome stop you and say, this is good enough. And you kept moving forward with it. What'd you learn from doing all that? Like, what was the best, kind of like, the most fulfilling part of it? Um, being able to, like, being able to push through something that's really uncomfortable, and even if it's your first time doing it, like, whenever you're doing something and you just, like, you, you don't want to do it, but it's not because it's bad for you, it might actually be good for you, um, but you just don't want to because it's too hard, or you just, it just, you don't, you just want to put it off. Um, pushing through and getting to the end, um, it feels so much better than quitting early because you, you did something. You did something that was hard and you stayed true to it. You pushed through it. Yeah, if it were easy, everybody could do it, right? Quitting's the easiest thing in the world. You quit once, it becomes a habit. It gets that much easier to quit again. So what's that? I want you just all, you don't have to say this out loud, but I want you to think, like, what's that difficult thing that you want to quit that you know you need, you know you need to do and you shouldn't quit? Is that someone telling me, like, I should just shut up? Okay, good. So just think for a minute on that. What's that thing you know you need to do that's uncomfortable, that you'd like to quit? but you know you shouldn't, right? Right? It might not even be academic, right? So for the parents in the room, this might be, a, this is a fan favorite for the parents who've all been there, watching our kids at night, hoping for a better day the next day, right? So we talked about body language before, and I think this is just one of the greatest examples of what Piper did. Is getting a sense of just through um, his stance, his, his body language, the angle, the rain falling, the incline of the hill, and then what happens after that. Yep, he's a struggle bus, right? Let's talk a little bit about this, Piper. We went back and forth on a couple of these pages, and you were frustrated with sort of how to kind of blend those pages together and really convey what you wanted to with uh, the incline and, and literally the struggle, like they said. What, what was going through your mind? you know, from the rough draft to how you ended up finishing it. Well, I kind of wanted this page, I mean, in a way, it can be symbolic. I mean, anything is symbolic, you put enough meaning to it, obviously, but um, I, I kind of wanted to show that Rudy, Rudy was struggling and um, he was pulling himself out of the water, then already out of the water, to kind of, to kind of show that you can pull yourself, oh my gosh, sorry about that, you can pull yourself, you can pull, your, pull yourself out of something um, even if it's even if it's hard, kind of. Yeah. And we all need help from time to time, right? Isn't that sure. like Rudy goes from all this failure and competing against the cheetah to helping him? And sometimes we get so wrapped up in competing that like 
we don't realize like winners help other people win. And I kind of want to touch on that. So what I'd like you each to do is, I know you all know each other, it's a small school. Just play along with me for a second here. Like everybody, stand up and get five high fives from their classmates to sit back down. If you have no one to high five, come find the new Piper. We will high five you. So what did we just do? We didn't social distance, thank God. What did we just do? Would you believe, I told you this, would you believe that by high-fiving your classmate, you built more trust and more connection with that person than if you sat across this lunch table you're at for an hour and talked to them? Show hands if anyone believes that. Are they? Okay, so one person, everybody else thinks I made that up. I'm sorry. So would you believe that by high-fiving a person for a matter of like a split second, you made more of a connection with them, built more trust with them than if you sat across the lunch table and talked for an hour? Now, let's see show hands. Anyone, anyone else believe that? Okay, five people. That's awesome. I told you it was a tough crowd. So here's the thing. There are these researchers. How many of you are sports fans? Sports fans? Right, how many of you know what sports are? You've heard of sports? You know how to spell sports? That's better. So there are these researchers in California, the University of California, and they studied uh, every single point of contact in the NBA, and this is back in 2007. And they studied high fives, fist bumps, and uh, players helping each other up on their team when they fell down. And what they found was the most high-touch teams had the highest winning percentage. The most low-touch teams had the lowest winning percentage. Why do you think that is? All right, again, this is the interactive portion. Why do you think that is? Anyone? Because they're what? They're bonding? Is that what you said? What did you say? Yeah. So it's teamwork, they're bonding, and here's like what's actually happening. When you make contact with someone, whether it's a fist bump or a high five, your brain starts to secrete a chemical to your body. And doctors call it the trust chemical. Do you know what that is? You know what the trust chemical is? So it's called oxytocin. I did not, for all the grown-ups, no, I did not just say oxycotton to a room full of students. It's called oxytocin. It's the trust chemical that comes out of your brain. So when there's a greater environment of trust, there is greater success. And that just doesn't have to do with sports. It has to do with everything. Okay? And like how you celebrate success with your classmates as opposed to competing with them, like celebrating other people's success is going to bring you more success. It's going to bring you more happiness. They studied World Cup soccer teams that same year, 2007, and they found that the teams that celebrated the small wins, great plays, uh, ended up having more big wins. So think about how you can celebrate the small wins in your life. You know, the small wins were like us texting back and forth, hey, we got this page done, looks awesome, thumbs up, you know, it might be an emoji, an emoji, it might be a text, it might be a high five or a fist bump, but celebrating those small wins get you bigger wins, you know? Um, I think it's hugely important because so often, you know, we're competing for what in school? What are we competing for? Grades. Grades? What else? Sports. What? Sports. Sports? What else? Your teachers are competing to, to uh, teach us. Well, to teach you. Look, there's these standard learning exams. Right? Yeah. 
So as opposed to competing, why don't we do something else? Why don't we help each other win, okay? So we're gonna do one last thing and then we'll take some Q&A because I, I know you guys have some questions for Piper. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to pair up. It's perfect that we're at rows of tables because I want you to pair up from the person with the person across from you. And we're gonna compete a little bit here, okay? Here's how we're gonna compete. And I need all the teachers to do the same thing as well. The competitors are going to come out right now. you got to find somebody to pair up with. Right? All right, if you can hear me, clap your hands once, twice. All right, listen up. Here's what we're going to do. The competitors are coming out. If you don't have someone to compete with, I need you to pair up with someone else and find them because you are going to thumb wrestle. You're going to have a little thumb war, okay? Now, before you start talking trash, before you get started, you are going to have exactly one minute to see how many pins you can get of the other person. How many times can you pin the other person? Huh? You use your other hand. There you go. All right? On your marks. And you gotta keep score, okay? You gotta keep score. On your mark, set, go. Stop keeping score. Your minute is up. Okay? We're competing there, right? So show of hands if you got three or more pins. Okay? Keep your hand up if you got eight or more. Twelve. Sixteen. Again, honor system, 18. Your hand was down and it just went up again? 20. 25. 30. I don't believe you for a second because your hand was down and now it's up again. 35. 40. Okay, I'd like you to come up here and show us how you did that. Who are you partnered up with? Bring them. Were you going to wrestle yourself? Huh? I want you to make sure your classmates can see you guys. Now stand up. Show us what you did. I held Were you him like point shaving? <laughs> You're just letting him win? I held him down for 60 seconds. That, that would be one pin. Oh, but like, he kept, he kept going up and down. Okay. We were like bouncing up. Yeah, yeah. So were you deliberately hanging or no? He was like, Okay. So here's the fun thing. You're juking him out yeah. with your backpack on. No, with my fingers. Because you look so agile. Okay, so... It was like an action movie. I believe that. So here's, you, you guys are like really close to getting the right answer. Most of you had like what, 10, 12, maybe. Would you believe sometimes when we do this activity, sometimes people have like 120 as their score? Anyone believe that? That's really like an action movie, 120. So how do you think they got 120? What do you think they did? They did not cheat. What were my instructions? 
or my exact instructions that was not played dirty. Did I say played dirty? Yes. Oh, thanks. Well, my exact instructions were we're going to keep score, see how many times you can pin the other person, you have a minute. Right? Those are my exact instructions. So put your hands together like you're wrestling. Okay? Now take your other hands, cross them over, and put your other hands together like you're wrestling. Now take turns letting... No. We're not dancing. Okay? This is not the Texas two-step. Right? Let him pin you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's two. Now you let him pin you. Four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty-two, twenty-four, twenty-six, twenty-eight, thirty, thirty-two, thirty-four, thirty-six, thirty-eight. I don't know what comes after thirty-eight. You guys all get it. All right. Give him two claps. Two of you and your backpack can have a seat. Good job. So here's the thing, we're so busy competing for grades, competing for a standard learning test, competing for sports, that we don't realize what winners help other people win. What if we can help somebody else win, we both win more, right? We both win more, okay? There's a wonderful, and we need page views, so I want you to go to, uh, is it K-I-I-I-TV.com? Uh, there's a wonderful interview with Piper, with a TV station at Corpus, and the best part of all that was, like, I didn't want to see myself on TV at all. I'm more of a face for radio with this whole project. I wanted them to shine a spotlight on what she was doing and be able to see her signing her autograph on books. Like, I don't need that. I want to see her win. I want to see this be this project be a huge springboard for her career. And I, I think that you need to take this mindset of winners help other people win. Right? If you're a teacher with a lot of life experience, a lot of classroom experience, how can you help a younger teacher? Because they're leaving the profession in droves daily, right? If you're a parent, you know, and you uh, have a student who's an upperclassman, how can you help the other parents of, let's say, freshmen? I know we don't have freshmen here in upperclassmen, but like if you're a parent of a high school student, like wherever you are, how can you help those parents get acclimated to the school, right? How can you help your classmates? How can you bring other people into your world? Like I had a rule when I was teaching and coaching, nobody sits at lunch by himself, right? You bring other people along for the ride to enjoy success. And that's my goal for you, and that's really why we're here, to look at how you can have a challenge and persevere you know, at a young age and enjoy success because you didn't give up. And that's exactly what Piper did. So now we want to open it up for a little Q&A. You have questions for her and how she did what she did. And uh, we appreciate your attention today. I hope you had some fun with all those activities and listening to her insights and what we shared with you. Who was the first question? A question we've often gotten in the past. Oh, you have a question. Okay, go ahead. How many books have we all made? That was the question. I'll let Piper answer that. One. Oh, there you go. Next question. Yeah, you. <laughs> a few concepts that were just paper and pencil, but ultimately everything was, everything was digital, yeah. Any, any more questions? Next. You! How long did you make the book? I started in January and finished it in May, so about like five months, almost exactly five months. So here's the best part, I wanted to save this, we didn't actually touch on this, was, did we talk about the extension you wanted? So like she sent me the what I thought were the final drawings, and I thought they were wonderful, and I loved them, and they were great. And she's like, I'm not comfortable with this. I'm like, what? She's like, I'm not comfortable attaching my name to this quality of work, this level of work. Some of that was the imposter syndrome. Some of that was like perfectionism. Would you, would you say it's accurate, Piper? Yeah. And then... 
we landed on, I think, uh, she wanted a 60 day extension and ended up being like six weeks. And I thought there's no way she can improve on what she did, but okay, let's see. Again, like I trusted her and she blew away my expectations. It was even better. That final, final draft was even better than what I thought. So, you know, I, what, what's the lesson for everybody in that? You know, I know what I took from it. What, what do you think is the lesson? But why do you ask for that? The extension? Yeah. Because I didn't think I was going to finish in time, but I ended up finishing it in time, finishing it in time because of the extension. So. You weren't initially really happy with what you did. That too, yeah. I yeah. About that. Um, so what I love about that story is, like, so often people just think good enough is good enough and good enough isn't. And how can you deliver a little more? How can you deliver a little better? You know, it's this, like this dialogue right here. Oh yeah, this is as high as I can go. When you actually have more in the tank and there's more you're capable of. And just to be able to recognize that yourself, you know, as a student, and then deliver on that is huge. Other questions? Students, teachers, administrators. I want to thank you for your time. We'll stick around afterwards if people want to talk one-on-one -on -one or have questions you didn't think of. And uh, round of applause for Piper. Oh, we have one more question. Yes. What's my favorite book I wrote? I'm having trouble hearing you. What'd you say? What's your favorite book I wrote? And this has been my favorite project, start to finish, with everything involved, for all the reasons we just talked about. Um, you know, I, I would like to think my favorite book is going to be my next book, because like, I want to get better at what I do every time I do it. You know, I know that's not really the answer you're looking for. This is my favorite project, but like, I want to see how much more I can improve what I'm doing next time. Was there another question, or are you just doing your hair? What's that? What do I think about the Astros? Um, and this is totally unrelated. But anytime the Philadelphia sports teams can lose, I'm happy. Whether it's the Astros or anyone else.